Hello and welcome to the BYU Family History Library webinar series. We're glad you could join us today. I'm Brian and I'll be your host for this webinar. Please make sure your microphones and web cameras are disabled during the presentation to provide for a smooth recording. If you have technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box and I can address your concerns. You are welcome to use the chat box during the webinar for comments and insights. However, all questions will be addressed at the end of, of the presentation. Our next webinar is going to be on the 8th, and that will be Family Resilience with uh, Rachel Rifkin. And just like this week, that will be on Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. If you'd like to access a previous webinar, please visit our webinar index on our website or search on our YouTube channel. All of our webinars are recorded and uploaded by the following Monday through your convenience. We also post links to recordings and other updates on our Facebook and Twitter accounts. For today's webinar, we are pleased to hear from Catherine Grant, who will be giving a presentation on Duplicates and Family Tree Part 2, How to Resolve Them. After years on the sidelines, Catherine began doing family history and discovered that she loved it. Her specialty is helping new family historians find success and maybe even avoid some of the mistakes she's made. Catherine teaches Sunday classes at the BYU Family History Library. She also presents at Riverton, Utah Saturday seminars and other family history events. Her column on family history ran in the Nauvoo Times for about a year and is still available online. In addition, she is a regular contributor to the Family Search blog. Catherine works as a technical writer and instructional designer with a focus on usability and process improvement. Besides family history, she loves uplifting music, thought-provoking books, and summertime. And if Catherine is ready, then we'll turn the time over to her. Well, everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. As you've seen, this is part two of a two-part webinar on duplicates in Family Tree. The focus of this one will be on how to resolve those duplicates. So let's take a look at what we'll be covering today in this webinar. We've got a section on how I can be confident that two records really should be merged. And I think really that's the heart of this webinar. We got into a little bit in the last webinar, but we're going to go into more detail today with some practical examples. Then we will actually do a demo of merging duplicates live in Family Tree. That's always an interesting proposition, but we tried it in an earlier webinar and it seemed to work okay. So after that, we will reinforce what we've learned with tips, tricks, and reminders. Then I wanted to comment that in part one of this webinar, I mentioned that I would include a section on fixing an incorrect merge. And I added that, I had that in this webinar because when I first did this webinar, like back in 2014 or something, it was part of it and it fit. But with this new section, this first section that I've added that I feel is so important, it actually made the webinar too long with this, with this last part. So either we'll break that out into a, its own webinar or we'll do a quick reference guide or something, but I just did want to mention that even though last time I said this would be covered, it turned out not to be practical. So we won't be talking about fixing and correct merges today. So let's go ahead and dive into the first topic. How can I be confident that two records really should be merged? Before we even discuss that, let's talk a little bit about why we even care. Like, why is it a big deal if two records get merged and they're not the same person? Uh, as an example, I, a, a friend of mine shared, he's also, he's a family history teacher, and he shared a reason statement that he found on a merge. This is no kidding, in Family Tree, the user had written for the, as her reason for merging, I do not think these people are the same person, but I'm merging them for consistency. So I'm not quite sure what she meant by consistency, but it was just very interesting that apparently she didn't see a problem with merging two people who were who she knew weren't really the same person. The, the two records did not represent the same human being. So I'd like to explain a little bit why that's a problem when we merge two people who are not really the same person. 
These incorrect merges can lead to more mistakes, including more incorrect merges, because once you put two records together with different information, even though they look like they're for the same person, you've got contradictions and so forth, and then you get bad hints, you get people adding the wrong children, the wrong spouses, and so forth. So incorrect merges do tend to snowball. Not only that, they don't just snowball in the immediate family, they go across multiple generations. I've seen bad merges cascade to as many as five generations. In other words, that, that first bad merge just kept going down and down and down and affected multiple generations. Bad merges can cause duplicates because imagine that you've got person A and person B, they're not the same person but we merge them together and person A is hidden inside person B. Well, then a user comes along, looks for person A, doesn't find them and says, oh, they're not in the system. So I guess I need to add them, not realizing that they are hidden because of a bad merge. And I've seen that happen more than once. Also, incorrect merges can result in invalid or delayed temple work. And maybe the most significant problem is that it does require quite a bit of effort to repair. So bad merges, especially multiple bad merges, are very tricky to untangle correctly. It takes a lot of time to uh, research them and figure out what's really going on. And so you can see that when we do an incorrect merge, it really leads to a lot of problems. And so it's worth it to avoid it, if at all possible. I wanted to borrow a metaphor from the construction industry, which I think is really apropos here, and that is measure twice, cut once. So in other words, if you do adequate due diligence and preparation, then it makes your job so much easier and you don't have to redo things. And that's certainly true when we're merging. So let's get into a little process here that you can follow so that you can be confident that two people really should be merged. The first step when you see two records that appear possibly to be the same person is just to do a quick sanity check. So you want to compare information like their birth date and birth place and so forth, their relationships, their spouses, children, parents, siblings, you also want to look at the sources and as you're doing all of this and I'm not talking about you know a three-hour analysis of a record really I'm talking about maybe two or three minutes where you scan the record just make sure that it's kind of in your head as to who this person is and you also want to be watching for signs of any incorrect merges or other problems, such as big gaps between children or a person married to multiple spouses at the same time. So anything, any of those little red flags, you kind of just want to make a note of as you do this sanity check. Then you want to go into the change log and try to determine who each person was intended to be when they were created. Because every time somebody made a person in Family Tree or even any of the earlier systems, they always had a specific human being in mind. Well, I should say virtually always. Uh, not always they thought, okay, this is my great grandmother who was born such and such a time, such and such a place. They, they really did have a, a particular human being that they were creating the Family Tree record for. That information can get hidden due to bad merges and so forth. So again, as you go through the change log, you want to watch for signs of incorrect merges or other problems. Then once you've done those two kind of sanity checks, then if necessary, you want to resolve any problems that you've found, such as incorrect merges. And you may notice that it's uh, necessary to do additional research. Maybe you can't tell from the information on the two records whether they're actual duplicates or not. So then once you've done all that, you come to the decision point. Are they really the same person? And we want to be so careful here that we rely on facts and not assumptions. It can be so easy to say, oh, well, everything is lining up. I don't know for sure, but I'm probably about 90% sure. So I'm going to go ahead and do the merge. But I'll, we'll see an, in some examples today how making those kinds of assumptions 
assumptions may lead to bad merges. Well, once you've determined, you've kind of got three outcomes when you try to make this decision of whether two records represent the same person. Either they clearly are, and in which case you perform a merge, or they clearly aren't, and in that case you mark them not a match, or the third possible outcome is that really we can't tell. And that is a completely legitimate conclusion. You may get to the end of your due diligence and say, you know, I've done my best. I've looked in all the possible records I know, and I can't tell if these are the same person. If that is the case, it's very important not to merge. The risks of not merging are much lower than the risks of doing a bad merge. So that's our little process. Let's go ahead and look at this as applied to two scenarios in Family Tree. So our first example here is Phoebe Ann Gunton, and I'd like to go ahead and invite you to put your observations in the chat. We, uh, I've, we found out, I'm going to open up the chat actually here so I can see it, but if you are watching the recording of this webinar, I believe you will not be able to see the chat. So I, we've tested it and it just seems like Zoom disables recording of the chat window. But let's go ahead for people who are attending today, please feel free to put your observations in the chat and then I'll mention something verbally if it needs to be called out. So first of all, everybody, look at these two records. We've got a record for Phoebe Ann Gunton ending in GHW, another record for a Phoebe Ann Gunton ending in G9P. What do you notice about the information for these two women? Oh dear. Okay, back up to the top. Sorry, that was my um, cord accidentally hit my mouse thing. Okay, so Terrell says everything looks good. Joanne comments that there aren't any visible sources, and that's true. We're actually going to look at the sources in a minute. So Joanne, thank you for pointing that out. Joe points out that everything is the same. Kathy says the same thing. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There is no difference that I can see, at least, between these two records as far as the vital information. Let's go ahead and look at the family. What do you notice about this? Yeah, for everybody who already posted that it looks the same, you could make exactly the same comment, right? The only difference between these two records is the PID. Other than that, everything is absolutely the same. As it turns out, there was only one source for both of these records, and it's this one that we're looking at. So there was only one Phoebe Ann Gunton who was christened on this date in Norfolk, England, with a mother of Phoebe. There was absolutely no evidence that there were two Phoebe Ann Guntons christened on that day. And so you probably remember then that the last, oh, and Sandy points out that we're going to have duplicate parents to merge, and that is absolutely right. Sandy, thank you for making that comment in the chat. So the last thing that we want to check is the change log. Go ahead and look at that and tell me if you see any discrepancies in the change log. So once again, all we've got different is the PIDs of the people involved. Other than that, everything absolutely lines up. So this is what we could really call a slam dunk. It's got the same name. Oh, I apologize. Kathy mentioned that it's so little it's difficult to see. I apologize for that, Kathy. It was quite small. Um, hopefully, if you rewatch the recording, you could get it on a screen where you could actually magnify it out. So thank you, because other people are probably going to run into that too. So hopefully, you can get on a screen where you can enlarge the view of the recording. Recording. So this one really is a slam dunk. We've got the same name, christening date and location, the same mom. They both evidently came from the same christening record and there were no incorrect merges or other obvious problems. So this one, we're safe to say, yep, we're going to do a merge on this person. Okay, let's look at a second example, this time for a woman named Ruth Greenwood. You notice over here that family search 
has suggested a possible duplicate of a Ruth with no surname with the PID that ends in B7S. So the first thing we want to do is take a look at Ruth's vitals, the first Ruth, uh, her vital information, and we notice that she was born and christened in 1836. In fact, look at this. The family had her christened on Christmas Day. So that's kind of fun. I can imagine that would have been just a really cool experience for that family, very meaningful to have their baby christened on the day of the Lord's birth. They, this um, Ruth was christened in Yorkshire and also born in Yorkshire. So now that we've got her vitals kind of in our minds, let's go ahead and look at her family. Family. So uh, this is, again, pretty straightforward. We've got a husband of James Schofield, and his birth and other information isn't visible on this screen, so I've put it in this pop-out. He was born in 1835 in Oldham, Lancashire, and he is an innkeeper by profession. James and Ruth have seven children. The children are all born in either Hollandwood, Lancashire, or Oldham, Lancashire. So that's what we know about the family. Then we come in here and we look at the sources. And again, because we don't want to make the video too long, we're not going to look at every single source. But I did go ahead and look at these sources, and they all appear to apply to this woman that we've been looking at. I didn't see any apparent problems. Last of all, we go to the change log. Remember that you read the change log from the bottom up. The oldest information is at the bottom. So she's got the same christening. She's got the same name. She's got the same birth. She's got the same parents. I haven't reproduced the whole log here, but I did look through the whole thing to see if there were problems, and I didn't see any problems. It appeared very clear that Ruth was intended to be the woman who was christened on Christmas Day in 36 in Yorkshire, the daughter of William Greenwood and Hannah Sutcliffe, the wife of James Schofield, and of course the mom of all those that we looked at. So that's a, a quick summary of Ruth Greenwood. Now let's look at Ruth's possible duplicates. So folks, what do you see? And you're very welcome to put this in the chat. What do you see about Ruth's vital information? Oh, and while you're looking at that, I see a message from Joe saying, where is the change log shown? The way you get to that on the person page is go to latest changes on the right hand side and then click show all and that will show you. Yeah, Kathy points out the um, for Ruth, there is no vital information. There's her name, there's her sex, there is nothing else. So really, all we know about Ruth's vitals is that her name is Ruth and she's a woman. Okay, what about family members? What do we notice there? Yeah, Sandy has pointed out we've got a spouse of James Schofield, which matches the other spouse, and we've got a daughter, Lavinia. Yeah, Joe points out just not a lot of children like the others. We've just got this one child here. Oh, um, Susan, let me address your question on reference at the end of the webinar, if that's okay. Brian, I, I think you're making a note of those. So that's actually a different topic than we're discussing, but I'd still like to answer that question. So I appreciate you asking that. So this is what we see for Ruth's family. It's pretty sparse information, but it is enough to go on to try and determine if these women are really the same person. So just to summarize what you've already said, we've got no vital information. We've got a spouse with the same name as the other Ruth spouse, but he too has no vital information. And we've got a daughter who was christened in 1871 in Morley, Yorkshire. As we look at the sources for Ruth, there is only one for this possible duplicate Ruth, and it is clearly the right source because it shows her as being the wife of James Schofield and the mother of Lavinia. Then we go to the change log, and there are no apparent problems here. This is the oldest entry, so Ruth came into the system as the wife of James Schofield, as the mother of Lavinia, and all the other information. We've got the relationship types here that are what we would expect. 
uh, we've got a name, we've got a source, everything applies to the root that we looked at, but let's take a look at what we actually know about these two roots. So we put it here in a table side by side. The first root that we looked at, we've got her vital information, her husband's vitals, and all the kids here with dates and their birthplaces in parentheses. Then we've got our possible duplicate with no vital information, husband with no vitals, and the daughter with a christening date of 71 and a christening place of Yorkshire. So tell me what you notice about this. What are your thoughts? Do you think this is the same person or not? So Joe asks, is the place of the christening correct? Good question. I believe that it is because the source supports it. So Terrell comments, look for a census for Lavinia. I agree with that. That is a great approach because honestly, as we look at this, okay, could they have a kid in 71? Could this family have a kid in 71? Yeah, it fits. Uh, Joe just pointed out that totally fits. The place is different, but as it happens, Lancashire and Yorkshire are right next door to each other. These two places are about 30 miles apart. It's a little unusual for a family at that time to have a child in a different location and all the rest of them are in the, the original location, but not impossible. So to summarize, Let's see, I've got a couple of more things in the chat here. Let me look. Um, look at the date of the child, Lavinia. Yeah, 1871. So, Bryant, I think you may be uh, asking this question for somebody else. If you're not certain that it's a duplicate, what happens if you mark it not a match? That's a very good question. The system will stop considering it, it, it a duplicate. So, we also don't want to mark it not a match unless we really know that they're not the same person and joe comments don't merge since you're not sure and that's absolutely right the bottom line here oh eileen comments that the census will give us some clues and i agree that's a great place to check so we don't see any absolute contradictions here but we also don't have definite proof so at this point we aren't ready to merge. So in line with the really good comments that have been given, we need to know, is Ruth, the mother of Lavinia, the same person as Ruth, the mother of the Lancashire children? And to, de to determine this, we could do what was suggested. So there's actually three possible sources that we could easily and quickly check for English people at this time. So we can look at Lavinia's christening record. We looked at the index of the christening record, but we could look at the image because sometimes on the image, there's a birth date and there's a father's occupation. So if it turns out he's an innkeeper, that is really strong evidence that he is the same as the dad of the, the seven children. The other thing, as was mentioned, is we can look in the census. That could tell us the father's occupation. And it could also tell us if she's with those other kids. Because if she is, that's really good evidence that she belongs as part of that family, even though she was christened in a different location. And then finally, we've got a great resource in England at this time, which is civil birth registration. Those are governments kept by the record, and they always, well, almost always, include the mother's maiden name. So if the mother's maiden name is Greenwood, we've got our absolute proof that these people are the same. So let's go ahead and look, and I apologize that this was one of the christening records that uh, is very difficult to read, both because it's kind of faded and because the handwriting is a little difficult, but let's walk through it. We've got Lavinia here, who is the daughter of James and Ruth. This really does say Schofield, especially if you blow it up. You've got the S-C-H-O-F, the swoopy F, I-E-L-D. Then this says Morley, even though that's very hard to read, and then the name of the clergyman who made this christening record. But you guys, what you notice about this record that is a little bit unusual for a christening? And fortunately, it's actually one of the darker items here on this, on this 
thing. Yes, Eileen pointed out, it says that she was 15 years old when she was christened. That's very unusual, but it's not unprecedented. I've had other people on my lines who have also been christened as teenagers or adults. If for some reason they their parents didn't do it when they were a baby, maybe they weren't really that um, active in their church and then this person really felt a need maybe they read the bible and they're like oh i have to have that ordinance or or that sacred rite performed so for whatever reason she yeah kathy pointed out 15 years old for whatever reason she was 15 when she was christened and that changes our search because now we know that this Lavinia was born in 56 and not 71. And I'll tell you, when I was actually working on this line, I searched and searched for a Lavinia Schofield born in 56 and there wasn't one that, that even came close to the people that, that, the families that we were looking for. They were all in different places or, you know, just didn't line up. So, this was a very important piece of information and it was necessary for our census search. So now let's go ahead and look at what we find in the 1861 and the 71 censuses. And I, in, because of time and because of space limitations, I just clipped out the names and the ages, but let's look at the relationships. So Ruth is listed as the sister to George Firth, and Lavinia is listed as his niece. So what does that tell us about Ruth's probable maiden name? Let's look at the next one. In this one, we find Lavinia without her mother, but she's listed as being the granddaughter to Joseph Firth. So yeah, we've got Joanne comments probably Ruth's maiden name is Firth, not Greenwood. There's a way that we can verify that in civil registration. So here is the, the view or the screenshot of the civil registration record for Lavinia. And what is Lavinia's mother's maiden name? Not unexpectedly, it's Firth based on the research that we already did. So the conclusion is that those two records for Ruth should not be merged. So imagine if we had just looked at that first comparison and said, well, it's James Schofield and there's a, a gap for the kid, so it could be, and we hadn't done our due diligence, we could have made a mistake that would have messed up that family for generations, uh, both in terms of additional research, in terms of temple work and so forth. So, and, and it honestly did not take me that long to do that search. I actually did a logo search in Family Tree. If you're curious what that is, over on the right-hand side of the page, there are some logos for Ancestry.com, for Find My Past, and so forth. If you click those logos, they actually take the information off the person page and run a search with that information. So I did that, except for the GRO. That one you have to go to a different site, or excuse me, the birth registration. I said GRO because it stands for General Register Office, which is the place where these births were registered or where the, the copies of the registrations are held. So I, this honestly took me... I don't know, a maximum of maybe 10 or 15 minutes to do this. So it wasn't like I spent hours and hours of tedious time. I just flipped over to Ancestry, checked the key records, found the information that I needed, and that little investment of time was enough to stop a bad merge. And I just feel like that is so valuable. And I noticed that um, Joe has confirmed not a match. And, oh, Joanne commented that maybe uh, Lavinia was going to get married and needed to have a christening on record in order to get married. That's a very good theory of why she might have, have chosen to be christened at an, an older age. And then Terrell points out, take the time to add sources to both of them, and often the question of duplicity is resolved. And that's very true. Once you add the sources, you realize they're not the same person, and you can add that missing maiden name, you can add the missing father's information and so forth. Then Family Tree realizes they're two different people and they don't show up as a possible duplicate anymore. So thank you for those great comments in the chat. 
So now we are to the exciting part of actually going through a, a real merge in Family Tree. So I'm going to move over to Family Tree and please post in the chat if you cannot see this. I believe that I shared it correctly so that you would see whatever screen I shared, but somebody please say if you can't see the screen. You should be looking at the Family Tree record for Eliza Guest. Okay, Joe says he sees her. I'm guessing since Joe does, probably everybody else does. So you notice over here, we've got a possible duplicate for an Eliza guest. Oh, and I should say that rather than forcing everybody to go through the whole thing again, we've already gone through our due diligence exercise twice. I've already gone through this and I know that these Elizas are the same person. Now we want to focus actually on the mechanics of doing a merge. So I want to click possible duplicate and I want to click Review Merge. Sometimes people think that they should click Eliza Guest. What that does is just open up her record. That is helpful if you want to do, to do a quick sanity check on her, but it won't give you the screen where you want to do the merge. So we're going to click Review Merge. And we get this screen that shows the two women side by side or shows their two records side by side. You notice that the one on the left is marked as a possible duplicate. The one on the right is marked as a surviving person. What that means is that the one on the left is really going to be, they call it deleted, but the truth is it's really archived. If you go, if we go through with this merge and we do it, then you will not, this Eliza Guest will not come up in any searches. But if you know her PID, you can search for her and find her and it will say that she's been deleted. So the thing that I wanted to point out on this screen is that this screen almost never gives you enough information to determine whether these two people should be merged. Let me illustrate what I mean there. So as we scroll down, we see that she's got the same name and it's pretty unusual. So that's a that um, increases the chances that she's the same person. Her birth information is the same. Her husband's name is the same, but the children are different. On The one on the left has Robert, Hannah, and Sarah Jane. The one on the right has Joseph. As we just saw with our Ruth Greenwood, it is entirely possible for the Eliza guest, who's the mother of Joseph, not to be the mother of these other children. And you might say, well, Eliza's a pretty unique name, and that's true. But what I found in even my families with unique names is they tend to use the same names over and over and over. So it actually is possible that these Elizas are cousins living in the same place. And I did have that happen actually on my Bescoby line. There were two, I think it was Emma Bescoby, born in the same place six months apart. They looked like a duplicate, but they weren't. So you really need to do that due diligence like we walked through on those two previous examples and you pretty much can never guarantee from this screen that two people should be merged. So as I mentioned, I did the due diligence. I do know that these are the same people. So we're going to go ahead and click yes, continue. So on the next screen, and for those of you who are familiar with the old process, I wanted to highlight the changes that have been made recently by Family Search. It used to be that some things were automatically transferred from the um, the duplicate to the surviving person. Now almost everything is automatically transferred. The only things that are not automatically transferred are vital information. You have the option, you can transfer it if you want by clicking replace. And the other thing that actually doesn't show on this example, but we'll look at an example later, is if there is a relationship that conflicts. And so those are the only things that don't transfer over. Otherwise, all relationships transfer over, all sources transfer over, memories transfer over, and all temple ordinances transfer over. So again, the only thing that doesn't transfer over to the surviving person automatically is the vital information and 
a, a conflicting relationship and we'll see an example of that later. The one thing that has changed about this, if anyone from Family Search is watching this, I have a suggestion. It used to be if you hit continue, you could see the two people side by side and use that to write a good reason statement. For whatever reason, you no longer can see that comparison on the same screen as the reason statement. And I think that probably makes it harder to do a good merge. So I hope maybe in the future, the comparison will be visible for the third step. And then also, one thing I really like to do is grab the PIDs of the person and include those in the reason statement because then it's totally clear and unambiguous who you're merging. So I'm going to grab Eliza's PID here and you see it says that the P that the ID was copied and then I'm going to go ahead and go to continue. So if I were to write a reason statement like this, how helpful is that? It's true, right? Kind of a rhetorical question, but I wanted to raise that because so often I see that as a reason statement. That is actually not really a good explanation for why you did a merge because the very fact that you're doing a merge presupposes that they're the same person. So to explain that I'm merging two people that are the same because they're the same is almost kind of circular logic. So what we want to do here in a reason statement is very briefly explain how we know they're the same people. So I'm gonna say Eliza guest, and then I'm gonna paste in the PID and Eliza guest, and now I'm gonna grab this other PID. So what we're doing really, we're building a sentence. So I'm gonna say Eliza guest, blah, blah, and Eliza guest, blah, blah, were both married to a man named, let's say James Schofield, and also had the same children. And how do I know that? Because, oh, I actually forgot to mention this. I found little Sarah Jane died. We've got, um, you remember, we have these four children. Sarah Jane died as a baby. She died the same year she was born. But Joseph, Robert, and Hannah were all in the census together with James and Eliza. So that, and I also checked the birth registrations, everything, all the kids had a mother's maiden name of guest, guest, so I was very confident that they all belonged in the same family. So I could list the children here if I wanted to, and also had the same children. Uh, we've got, let's see, there was Robert, Hannah, I'm doing him in birth order, Joseph, and Sarah Jane. Now, could we go into more detail here? Yeah, we could include birth dates and different things like that. But honestly, my feeling is that a simple reason statement really is adequate because it tells why you think they're the same people. And then if somebody wants to check out, well, are, you know, are both the James Schofields? Do they have the same vital information and so forth? They can go ahead and look that up. I just, I don't think it's helpful to make people feel forced to, to write, you know, an essay on why they think these two people are the same. I think something simple like this is perfectly adequate and it gives any user enough information to look into it further if they would like to. So that is all there is to it and we're going to click finish merge. And now this Eliza guest has been merged with the other one and you notice there's no possible duplicate showing up. And somebody uh, pointed out earlier, and I apologize, I forget who it was, said that now we would want to merge the duplicate dads because right now we've merged the Elizas, but we haven't merged the husband. And so we've got James 1SC and James SPZ, and those both need to be merged. Eileen asks a very good question. She said, what is the undo button for? Thank you. I meant to mention that and I forgot. So I'm so glad you asked that. Because the sources are automatically moved over, 
they give you the option to move them back to the deleted person. So imagine that you noticed like five sources and four of them were good, but one of them was clearly didn't pertain to either of the people. Somebody had attached it incorrectly, so you didn't want it to stay attached. You could click undo and then it would not show up on the surviving person. So Eileen, thank you very much for asking that question. Okay, now we are ready to flip back over to the presentation and go on to our final section, which is tips, tricks, and reminders. So, as far as the first step of the merge, where you see those, those people compared side by side, remember how important it is not to rely on these pages when deciding whether or not to merge. They virtually never show all the necessary information. Information. In fact, I'm trying to remember, I think possibly on that Phoebe Gunton, that would have been enough information because absolutely everything lined up. But most of the time, I, I can't honestly tell from the information just on this first page or any of the merge pages whether the person should be merged. It's just worth doing that little bit of due diligence ahead of time to be sure that you're really merging two of the same people. Information cannot be edited during a merge. That comes up a lot. Like, for example, suppose that I did some research and I found out that about 1822 was right. It was actually 1823. And I want to change that right now while I'm thinking about it. Well, the interface doesn't allow that. So you either have to make the changes before the merge or after, but you can't do it during. Information on the right is kept, as we pointed out. Information on the left is deleted. And if you want to move information from the record to be deleted to the surviving record, then you just hit replace. Generally, the only reason you do that is if the information over here is better than the information, better or more complete. But otherwise, you don't need to worry about it. Oh, I think I forgot to mention this, and this actually would have been a good thing on that other record, because do you remember that the Eliza on this side had the three kids, the Eliza on this side only had the one child. So if I wanted, for whatever reason, to have the Eliza uh, with the three children be the surviving person, then I would have hit switch, and these two records would have been flip-flopped. And again, as we pointed out, this is a change from the old merge process. Now everything is moved automatically to the surviving person, so to the right of the screen, except vital information and conflicting relationships. So just by way of summary, the following are moved, relationships, sources, memories, items in the other information section, and ordinances. Now, when you might be asking, do I really want all the relationships moved over? For instance, in this one, they moved James Schofield over, and he's a duplicate of this guy. Did I really want them both moved over? My answer to that is yes, and it's purely practical. The reason I like to have them all moved over is it just makes it so much easier when I want to do the merge. So now, both these Jameses are attached to our surviving Eliza, making them very easy to see on the screen and very easy to do the merge. Another thing that trips people up sometimes is that only Eliza, only the person at the top, is going to be merged. Sometimes people assume that the duplicates below, such as this duplicate James Schofield, are going to be merged, but that is not the case. And I think that FamilySearch made a really wise decision there, because if you could merge multiple families at the same time, multiple members of families, I think that would just increase the number of bad merges. So only these two people are merged. The other duplicates that you see are not merged as part of this merge. Oh, and we have a call out that says that. I forgot I had that. Okay, here is the example of what we could call a conflicting or colliding relationship, and it was not moved over. What this, when this came up was when I started to merge the two James Schofields who I know are the spouses of this Eliza Guest XP8. But right now, Family Tree does not know that these guys are the same because I haven't merged them. In Family Tree, this James Schofield 
is connected to our ELISA XP8 but has no marriage information. This James Schofield is connected to the same woman XP6, excuse me, I think I said XP8, XP6, and uh, does not, or excuse me, does have marriage information. So right now the system considers these two separate marriage relationships. So that's why they didn't scoot this one over. If we hit replace, here's the important thing to be aware of, this marriage relationship, which is blank, will erase this marriage information. Uh, information. So if you see information that is worse on the left side of the screen, you never want to move it over to the surviving person. And that is true even if the PIDs are the same, if the marriage information or christening or whatever, if some other information is not the same and it's worse than what's on the surviving record, you do not want to hit replace. So I hope that is clear. If it's not, please do feel free to ask questions at the end of the webinar. So um, again, I have a call out on this just to emphasize, if you move it over, it will erase the marriage information on the other relationship. Okay, we talked about this. How well does this reason statement explain why the merge is being done? It really doesn't. And so we want to have a more thorough reason statement that explains what we saw about these two people that indicated that they are the same person. And again, I do like to include the PIDs. Someone may come along later and do merges, uh, you know, additional merges. Can you reconstruct the people that were merged at this time? Yeah, you can. You can do a little digging and figure out who it was, but it's just so much more convenient to uh, put those PIDs in. And this statement shows up in the change log, by the way. So anybody who goes into the change log will see your reason statement. They will know exactly what you did and why you did it. And I'm trying to advance, and it's not advancing. There we go. OK, a few additional considerations in closing. Know your families. Do accurate and reasonably complete research. Get a birth, marriage, and death if you can. Birth is the most important. But if it's easy and quick to find the others, why not, right? Uh, try and find parents, spouse, and children so you have a more complete picture of the family. Use a research log like the timeline grid. I won't go into detail on that, but we've got webinars about it. If you're interested, it's just a very simple research log. Then also be cautious when duplicates are likely. And here are a few examples of when duplicates are likely. When you're dealing with family records from the IGI, if you're not familiar with the IGI, we have a webinar on that too. So I'd encourage you to go to the uh, BYU Family History Library webinar page and look for that if you're interested in, in learning more. Extracted records for a given locality. Extraction is the old version of indexing. And as we saw with those duplicate parent records, uh, for both Phoebe and for uh, the second person that we worked on, the um, Schofield merge, the, there's going to be a lot of duplicates when there was extraction done. So be watchful for that. And then also I've noticed that duplicates are more frequent prior to the late 1800s. So I, I don't find as many, say, from 18, maybe 1870 onward. But before that, I do tend to find a lot. Part of the reason may be because the extraction was done in earlier time periods. Be especially careful with common names such as Brown, Taylor Smith, or if you're doing Hispanic research, um, Gonzales, things that uh, names that are just used quite a bit. That it makes it more challenging because you can have, uh, a, like if there's John Taylor, there's three John Taylors, you really have to do some pretty decent sanity checking to tell whether those are the same person or not. Even with uncommon names, as we mentioned before, families often use the same first name repeatedly, both within and across generations. My favorite example is Francis Bescoby on my Bescoby line. That's not a common name, but within the Bescoby family, it was an extremely common name. So even if I see two Francis Bescobys, uh, I'm going to be really careful before I merge them because they're a good chance. there's a good chance that they are a different person. 
In some cultures, children receive the same name as a deceased sibling. So if Alice Schofield was born in 1832, she died in 1833, they had another girl in 1834, they, would they might very well name her Alice Schofield as well. So be real careful. You might say, oh, well, they're so close together. They must be duplicates, but possibly not. So it's worth checking to see if you can find a death record for that first child and try and prove whether or not they're the same person. When in doubt, don't merge. That's really the bottom line. So for more information, if you'd like to dig into this a little bit deeper, there are three webinars that you might be interested in. A Double Trouble to Merge or Not to Merge goes into particularly how to avoid incorrect merges. This case study for Elizabeth Hepton goes into untangling of a simple, relatively simple, incorrect merge. And this fi fixing sticky, tricky problems in Family Tree tackles uh, some more uh, complex examples of undoing bad merges. So that brings us to the end of our webinar. You're probably glad now that I didn't include the um, parts about undoing bad merges because we've, we've gone for a good period of time here. We talked about how to tell if two possible duplicates really are duplicates. We did that demo of merging a, a known duplicate and then we reviewed tips, tricks, and reminders. So thank you, everybody. I sure appreciate you being here for the webinar today and hope you found that helpful. And we will now go to the chat for questions. And I see that Joe has asked, where do we find information on the timeline grid? Joe, the best way to do that is probably to go to the BYU Family History Library webinar listing and just do a search on that page for timeline grid. As I recall, there's about three webinars on that. And then also, if you, uh, let me show my email here. If that doesn't answer your question or you want more information, please do feel free to email me and I'm very happy to send you links to templates and, and different things like that. So uh, Joanne asks, can someone else undo your merge? The answer to that is yes. Anybody can undo a merge. Let me make a quick comment on that. If, no ch if you merge two people, like we just barely merged, made our merge, if someone went into that merge right now, there would be an unmerge button if no changes had been made to that person. If somebody makes even one change to that person, there's no longer an unmerge button because then the system doesn't know who to give that change to that was done since the merge because they assume if you're undoing the merge, then they aren't the same person. So who does that post merge change go to? So in that case, you actually have to undelete the person. You can't unmerge them. And then there was an earlier question, Bryant, and I apologize. Oh, it was about reference. It was about what the reference means in the change log. That actually provides you with additional information. If you click the word reference, for instance, many times it might show more information on parents for a person or something like that. Uh, so basically just click the word and see what you find out and see if it's helpful for you. That was a great question. Thank you for asking. And thank you for the people who have said thanks for the presentation. And do we have any other questions before we end our webinar? Thank you, Joanne. Yeah, Brian, it looks like we're probably done. Thank you, Ellie. And thank you for everybody for your positive comments. I appreciate that. Yeah, and thank, thank you, Catherine. We really appreciate the great webinar. Um, thank you. Kathy asks also, when will the correction course be held? Oh, good question. We have not scheduled that because I just realized today that, or maybe in the last couple days, to be honest, that it wasn't going to fit in. So Bryant and I will talk about that. And I would say, watch the upcoming schedule for when we do that on undoing incorrect merges, on how to correct incorrect merges. Well, awesome. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, and we'd just like to remind you about our webinar coming up and next week on the 8th, um, Family Resilience with Rachel Rifkin. And that'll be at 5.30 p.m. just like this week. So we hope to see you there. Thanks again, Catherine. And Thank you. Yeah, have a great day, everyone.
Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.